day to you and welcome to our garden here in Moraga. My name is Al Kite and we're doing a series of short videos on dimensions of beauty in the California native plant garden. And we've been kind of going through the year and today we're talking about June, July and August and our topic is the beauty of summertime. And uh, it, it's uh, early August and it's been a while, it seems, since we started getting the emergence of a lot of color in March and April and the peak bloom of early May. And yet, we, this, hot, this dry summer, in the middle of it, we still have uh, almost every color I could want just represented in some of these areas. And uh, I think I would owe that to just kind of careful planting of uh, just some of our plants that were, were, are still blooming, that were blooming in May combined with other plants that have just started blooming in summertime. And um, the, uh, some of the familiar ones are the sulfur buckwheat, the foothill penstemon, some of the poppies, uh, some of the monkey flowers are still blooming. But let's talk about the, the, the plants we haven't talked about, those that are that bloomed in the summertime. We start with white. White, white has been a good color for us. We have. Um, this time of year, the yarrow starts blooming, big patches of yarrow, and we have uh, some of the buckwheats. So some of the white buckwheats I have are the Santa Cruz buckwheat and the California buckwheat. And uh, every time I walk by those plants, there's a lot of insects on them. They're great pollinators. And the same holds true of the toyon. This time of year, that the toyon has beautiful white blooms. And uh, the other white blooming plant is uh, is the Pacific Onantha in our pond. And so white, we're in good shape. Red, we still have some red, red poppies, but the rosy buckwheat has, has been delightful for the last month and a half in the garden. And it gives us that nice red color, and of course leads into the last half of the summer when the epilo epilobium takes over and gives us nice uh, red bloom. Up by our stream, we have uh, one of our moisture-loving monkey flowers, the Mimulus cardinalis. So we're in good shape with red. Blue, we have coyote mint comes into bloom. Makes a great plant along the borders. That and also the mountain coyote mint. Great pollinators, as is, as, uh, is the aster, the California or coast aster that comes into bloom. Yellow plants, uh, we have a couple of really nice bushes that are great pollinators. The uh, Mattia elegans, uh, it's a big bush, and uh, we have uh, Grindelia camporum. Uh, both of them uh, just uh, very attractive to the bees. And we also have another yellow blooming plant uh, in the summertime. It takes over and peaks in August. And that's the rabbit brush that you see growing throughout the western deserts. We also have an orange blooming plant that, that, that blooms in June and early July, uh, the scarlet mallow. And it's a great pollinator as well. And it's the only plant to my knowledge so far that's brought in the, one of my favorite bees, the ultra green sweat bee. Uh, and we also have some pink blooms, a beautiful bloom with the desert willow. Uh, up by our stream, the spirea comes into peak bloom in June, and then we have another moisture-loving monkey flower, the Mimulus lewisii, which we find up near Oregon. In fact, in our garden, we also sometimes still have some uh, Mimulus guttatus, the other moisture-loving monkey flower. So we can get the three colors at once, which is kind of special. In the summertime, I also think of the foliage, mainly in its growth because uh, plants that have been growing for uh, just a few inches, all of a sudden, uh, certain years, will take off and put on a couple of feet on each branch. And, uh, kind of a teenager's growth spurt. I find myself having to go around and, and uh, kind of clear the pathways from growth. This gets to be an increasing problem with mature garden, because we get plants that are starting to grow in on each other, and crowd each other and sometimes plants actually have to be removed because plants as they grow taller also get wider and we sometimes uh, don't realize how wide they're getting. Uh, I'm particularly concerned with this in our garden in the chaparral area because shrubs tend to grow together and, and uh, make an impenetrable area and so 
what I have to do is keep some space because in fire danger you don't want to let the flames build up through constant fuel. I had to prune out the yerba, yerba santa in one area and just uh, show the manzanita and the spacing in between a little bit more. Uh, foliage removal also takes place on the ground level. Some of our most attractive spring wildflowers, the poppies and the uh, meadow or single leaf onion, just spread throughout the yard. It'll give this great color, but some of them go dormant early as well. And you're left with this kind of yellowish brown, dead looking foliage. And what I like to do there is take a hoe and scrape the ground and, and uh, remove the piles and put in a fresh coat of mulch. I think uh, also with this, you want to make sure you're planting about 75% uh, evergreens to make sure your garden has a pretty green look throughout. Uh, summer's a time of year I like to kind of kick back and uh, just savor my garden a little bit more. Uh, the springtime is it's, uh, with the tours, I've had to stay pretty busy running around keeping the, the garden looking uh, clean and presentable for people coming through. It's kind of nice to sit back and let the garden start taking, a, taking care of itself for a while. Uh, I think it's a good time of year for adults to just unwind, slow down, reflect on life itself perhaps. And uh, children also enjoy this time of year. Out of school and the pressures of time, they can come out quietly and paint or sketch or build sand castles or uh, maybe even climb through the, the, the uh, manzanitas. I have an area, I call the Manzanita Jungle Gym. And they, they do all kinds of pretend, even sleeping up there. The children are only limited by their imagination. The animals seem to ha like hanging out in the summertime better too. Part of it is I think they, there's less foot traffic in the garden, but after the morning flurry of bird activity, the birds are kind of just quietly hanging out. And I see doves and quail on the ground taking dust baths or just slowly walking. And some of the other birds just uh, very leisurely flight and perching a lot more. Uh, some other birds come into the area. Uh, Vantail pigeons come in frequently to, to check out the Elderberries, see how they're ripening, and uh, we even have some predators come through, such as the white-tailed kite. Uh, so I'm kind of reminded this time of year that our garden is a, it's really a place of refuge for animals, a place of uh, discovery for children, a place of peace for busy adults. It's a good place to be. A few years back, I was kind of disturbed. I went through Southern California, and I was buying a, a native plant at a nursery, and a woman waiting on me at the nursery said, you know, why, why uh, get native plants? It's just a spring display. And I was kind of shocked. And she didn't say anything about the importance of native plants to the environment, the role it has in water conservation, and what the role it can have in fire prevention, uh, certainly in restoring habitat in so many ways including encouraging endangered pollinators, the bees and butterflies. Uh, so I, I took, the, took a challenge. I wanted to see if I'd get beauty in the garden all year. I've had a few plants that are year-round bloomers, but I think maybe the best test of this is seeing every color displayed here halfway through a dry summer with have the variety of colors that I do. And uh, so, it's not just a spring display. In fact, we did this video series on dimensions of beauty. I think we've shown that the California Native Plant Garden can have beauty throughout the year. Anyway, we've enjoyed doing this series. I hope you've enjoyed being here. Uh, we thank you for uh, coming today. Thank you. Thanks.